tonight on 16 by 9 trapped in their bodies I refused to let them take him off life support and I asked for more time unable to communicate whatever it takes to make it happen right now doctors have a way to talk to them we have to do everything we can for every patient Here's Carolyn Jarvis. Good evening and welcome to 16 by 9. It's a common event in an emergency room. A patient arrives with a serious brain injury and a decision has to be made. Put them on life support in a vegetative state or let them die. In most cases, the doctors and families agree. But what happens when they don't? Okay, we'll call Tracy and get you up in the chair. Hmm? Slowly, try and relax your back. Nicely, again, slowly, go back. Good job. Every part of Winifred Rodriguez is willing her husband Leonard to respond. I'm not imagining it. It's happening. Two, three, come on, bring your body up, bring your body up. Good job. Good work. Two and a half years ago, Leonard went to bed after a long day's work as an aircraft technician. I woke up thinking I was hearing snoring, but it didn't sound like that. So when I turned the light on, I found him gasping for breath. Leonard was having a massive heart attack. He was a seemingly healthy man with a sense of fun, who liked to dance and play pranks on his kids. Suddenly, he was at the point of death. While my son was on the phone with 911, Leonard literally stopped breathing right there with me. Leonard's heart would survive, but his brain would never be the same. His brain was so severely damaged because of lack of oxygen that they didn't believe he would make it. At first, doctors told Winifred he was too severely damaged. The word vegetative came later to describe patients who appear awake but do not respond to any stimuli. Usually, that means no chance of recovery. Good job. Winifred has the unshakable belief that Leonard is still in there. Every day in these last two and a half years, I have said, if we don't try it with Leonard, we will never know what he can do. We will never be able to explore what he can do if we don't try it. We get some rest. Dr. Adrian Owen of Western University in London, Ontario, says these people are a lost population of patients. These are the patients that we're really interested in because they will slip through absolutely every net. By Owen's estimate, one in five of these patients is wrongly diagnosed as vegetative. A European study goes much further. It says up to 43% of vegetative patients should not be in that category. It doesn't mean that people are making mistakes 40% of the time. This is an extremely difficult patient population to diagnose. It's impossible to tell that the patient is conscious because they make absolutely no responses. Without these, these uh, research tools that we have, there really is no way for correctly diagnosing them. Winifred Rodriguez is convinced her husband is one of that lost population who will respond. A sign in his hospital room asks visitors to speak slowly and clearly because he can hear. I pull on each day because I keep reading back letters he wrote to me 30 years ago. That's how I keep my, my love and faith for him going. Her faith that with enough attention, with the right testing, with the right rehab, Leonard's brain will respond. Still, Owen cautions awareness and recovery are two very different things. I tend to not use the word recovery in this patient population because it's extremely rare. You know, at best, uh, those few patients who do recover after many months or years in a vegetative state, really, they're going to be very seriously disabled for, for the rest of their lives. Sixteen years ago in the historic university city of Cambridge, 26-year-old Kate Bainbridge made history. A virus had attacked and badly damaged her brain. Doctors believed she was beyond recovery. Then, she woke up from a coma. Here is how she describes it in a short video by a British filmmaker. The voice is that of a friend. The words are Kate's. It made my brain swell up and my muscles stop working. I was trapped in a vegetative state. 
I wasn't responding to anything at all. As far as the doctors could tell, my brain was no longer working. A prisoner in her body, unable to communicate her anguish, she remembers deep frustration. They said I couldn't feel pain, but they were so wrong. I just couldn't tell people. She spent 22 months in hospital, treated, she says, like a body, not a person. Words were just noise to her. I had loads of questions like, where am I? Why am I here? What has happened? They never even explained to me how they were feeding me. Questions that tormented her, but which she could not ask. She considered suicide, of holding her breath till she died. But during that painful hospital stay, there was one shining moment, a moment she now credits with turning her life around. Dr. Adrian Owen was then a young researcher at this Cambridge hospital. He was doing brain imaging work. Owen had access to an expensive new machine called a PET scan. He was looking for the ideal subject, and he found Kate. Their coming together was a eureka moment in medical science, helping usher in a whole new field of brain research. We put her into the, the scanner, really, you know, on, on a whim. We showed Kate uh, pictures, faces of her friends and family, and the part of her brain that we know now that is responsible for recognizing faces, it lit up just as it would in you or I. Dr. Barbara Wilson is a neuropsychologist who later took charge of Kate's rehab. So even though Kate wasn't responding to the environment, that her brain was responding normally to these photographs. And that was the first time this had been demonstrated. It was very interesting and exciting. We found the scan. I had no evidence. I was there. It was hell was there. But out of that hell, she says, the scan found her, showed her something was working. It was a kind of resurrection. It really does all go back to Kate Bainbridge. She was patient zero? She was patient number one. I think if she hadn't responded in the way that she had responded back then, we wouldn't be sitting here today. She really started this, this whole process. Some people might say that you found a way to speak to people who are otherwise considered lost or dead. Well, I think that's a, that's a reasonably good description. This is how Owen did it. It was the brain talking through electrical signals rather than words. So subtle that Owen is now able to get yes or no answers from his test subjects who can't otherwise speak. Owen says those yeses and nos are only the beginning. The holy grail here is to, to try and perfect our communication techniques, to have a system that is affordable uh, and could allow somebody to actually interact with the world around them or interact with their family on a routine basis without coming into my lab. That's where I'd like to be in five years. I want you to tell us whether you are in any pain. But as they develop new ways of talking to brain damaged patients, doctors face a dilemma. Could they ask a patient if he or she wants to die? My answer to that is an emphatic no, and I think it's entirely inappropriate at the moment. You know, we don't have a legal and ethical framework um, in this country and in, you know, in, in, in most other civilized countries for acting on that information. You know, I think morally and ethically we have to do everything we can for every patient that we find is in this situation. Patients like Kate Bainbridge, once considered vegetative, who now takes great joy from the simplest things, like standing up in her special wheelchair. She's learned to feed herself. She communicates with friends and admirers every day on the internet. She paints watercolors. She's even written a book about her life. I'm determined I have to prove you wrong. <laughs> I have to prove I can't, you can't recover. I'm my story, don't give up. Keep trying. It can take a long, long time. I keep going.